Steve Farrell. I'm um, a machine learning engineer, one of a couple of them in the uh, data and analytics services group at NERSC. I broadly speaking, I support machine learning workloads on our NERSC supercomputers. And of course, there are a lot of things that um, that that are included in that. Some of which I'll I'll talk about today. So the title is Deep Learning at Scale <clears throat> on Perlmutter. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about our our offerings at NERSC, the kinds of things that we do to support and enable cutting edge AI or or deep learning um, for science. And I'm going to have some stuff specifically in here as well from uh, a tutorial that we do regularly at, at supercomputing and some other places uh, with the exact same name, Deep Learning at Scale. Um, and what else do I have? I have some uh, fairly fresh uh, machine learning at NERSC survey plots that you know are nice to kind of illustrate what the community is doing and, and, and how we think about supporting those. Um, all right. I'm not actually going to do too much. I'm not going to say too much about deep learning or AI methods um, in an introductory sense. I, I do have some links to other resources, outreach events that we've done in case that's of interest to you. I, I will really only kind of touch on things that are most relevant to what I'm going to cover for how you deploy workloads and deploy them at scale. So um, I, I'm also happy to uh, answer any questions that come up, of course. Um, but as we probably all are acutely aware, um, AI is is really kind of uh, taking over the world in a lot of ways. It's um, it's certainly transforming science and, and, and shows a lot of capability to, to keep transforming science. Um, AI or machine learning or deep learning, I, I may use these interchangeably, but um, um, the title is deep learning. I'm mainly focusing on, on deep learning methods because that, that's the the kind of methodologies in AI that, that have really been dominant these days. Uh, but these have powerful capabilities for scientific workflows. Uh, just a few bullets here to give you a flavor of the kinds of things that people are doing. It's not exhaustive, but uh, people are using these methods to help with analysis of large data sets, um, maybe data sets that um, traditionally require more like um, hand labeling. Maybe you don't have an analytical way of, of doing your analysis, uh, but now you can automate it with machine learning or ways where you had traditional approaches to analyze that data. Um, but you know maybe they're based on some sort of assumptions or simplifications and um, machine learning methods are uh, able to get more out of your data. Uh, another area that's pretty relevant for the HPC space is acceleration of expensive simulations. Of course, the dominant types of workloads on HPC still today are these, you know, large, large scale simulation workloads. And a lot of these science domains are really limited in the kinds of science they can do by how expensive those simulations are. They cannot um, simulate systems large enough or enough systems in order to have a good estimate for things they're trying to compute. Uh, and so um, there's a lot of excitement and a lot of work going on in, in trying to replace uh, either simulations completely or uh, some of the calculations that happen in simulations with faster AI methods. Uh, another cool area is in control of complex experiments. So there are a lot of DOE experimental facilities that are looking at how they might be able to automate or even uh, have kind of more powerful control of their experiments with these methods. So, um, Science, of course, and, and the DOE as well are very enthusiastic about this. Uh, there's a lot of research going on, a lot of R&D. Um, the landscape is evolving rapidly, and partially that's because it's evolving rapidly elsewhere, too, um, in industry and, and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, the DOE has been taking notice, and you know, as the, EC, as the Exascale Computing Project is winding down, there's some anticipation, hopefully, for a future uh, similar scale project on AI for science. Um, and while the things are still, in some sense, new AI for science and uh, rapidly evolving, still we do see that some areas are starting to move into maturity, which is pretty cool to see. Uh, and these workloads, increasingly, they need large comp computational resources, even in the cases where they're replacing very expensive simulations, uh, still these can can need a bit of compute. So um, especially as, as it's maturing, we're, we're looking at folks tackling um, like larger problems 
larger data sets because these methods tend to be more powerful with larger data sets. Uh, so they're looking at more complex problems. They're using larger models uh, to get even better results. So everything's kind of growing in size and complexity, which means the computational costs grow. And, um, you know, we're looking at basically that the HP centers may be like the really a key role. They may play a key role in enabling this, this new kind of science. Maybe the largest models are trained at the, the big supercomputers and then uh, folks are able to use them in, in downstream science workflows. Um, this is like a, a very broad overview of, of how we articulate our AI strategy at NERSC. So how do we support you know, this new emerging way of doing science? Uh, first, we try to deploy, optimize hardware and software systems. We also work with scientists to apply AI on in, across different domains. We, we try to keep up on the cutting edge methods and tools. Uh, we have ways of engaging basically with different research groups um, and try to do some ourselves. Uh, but we also try to really educate and empower the community as well. So we do a lot of outreach, uh, seminars, workshops, training events like this one, uh, even um, things that we call schools. Uh, so on the hardware side, you know, you've already heard about Perlmutter, so I'm not going <laughs> to uh, say everything about it, but um, we call it a scientific AI supercomputer. Maybe not everybody else was was calling it at that at day to day. Um, but the, the really relevant thing here for AI is that this is a system with a lot of NVIDIA GPUs, which are, um, you know, pretty much state of the art for for uh, deep learning workloads. Um, maybe TPUs are, are a big competitor, but um, NVIDIA kindly called this the, the world's fastest AI supercomputer when we turned it on. Um, for the software side, so we try to find a good balance between uh, providing things to users that, that are well optimized for our systems, but also, um, uh, sorry, I was just trying to move this, not do that, but, but also letting people have the flexibility that they need to, to have their own software environments and their own things. So, so we build some optimized modules for the most popular frameworks. There's the usual Anaconda Python ones. We heard about Python earlier. Uh, but we do build and deploy PyTorch and TensorFlow uh, with some recommended libraries and backends for, for running on our systems. Um, we also uh, heavily support containers, particularly optimized containers from NVIDIA, these NGC deep learning uh, containers. And of course, we run things via Shifter, as we heard about earlier, and eventually Podman. Uh, users can also uh, bring their own images or customize on top of our images or the NVIDIA images and so on. Um, of course, it's, it's also fully possible for, for folks just to um, build their own Conda environments and have their uh, machine learning software done that way. Um, but it's not just about the frameworks. There's also a whole ecosystem that's growing. It's also rapidly evolving, but there's a lot of other things that users who are doing machine learning like to use. Um, things like, uh, well, hyperparameter optimization. So this is... Um, you know, you're, you're trying to train a model, but really you don't know all the settings of the model, like the number of layers or the, the learning rates and things. So um, you have to do something called hyperparameter optimization to, to find these. Um, and we, we, we use some tools, but we don't really pick and choose favorites here too much. Most tools, I think, uh, should work. But if folks have issues running their favorite tool on our systems, we're, we're happy to help. Uh, I think we, we mostly look at ray tune, weights and biases and stuff like that. Uh, Jupiter is a very popular service at NERSC. Uh, a, something like over 2,000 NERSC users uh, are somewhat regularly using Jupiter, and the machine learning users also um, like to develop their things in Jupiter a lot. So, of course, we support that. We provide kernels, and users can have their own kernels. For profiling and visualization, um, we recommend NVIDIA profiling tools, but um, uh, people like to use TensorBoard. We have a nice way of, of launching TensorBoard from uh, Jupiter Hub. Uh, and we use weights and biases a lot and encourage folks to, to try that. It's a great way to log experiments and also to do hyperparameter optimization. Um, so we uh, we do see that the, the AI workload is, is growing at, at NERSC. It's still a small piece of the pie, but we anticipate it just to keep taking off as, as time goes on. Uh, we do track the machine learning software usage to some extent. This is not all fully functional on Perlmutter yet, unfortunately, because it'd be really nice to see the kind of uptake we, we have right now uh, with GPU system. But um, 
Um, we, we generally we can track things like module loads and Python imports that might have been mentioned earlier earlier today on how that mechanism works. Um, but we have some data here that goes back from 2017 and we can see there's you know a pretty steady increase in the, the number of users there, uh, more than six times growth from 2018 to 2021. Um, we also track trends and engage with the community in, in, in this uh, machine learning at nurse survey. You may have seen some emails from us earlier this year. Uh, we're, we're still, we still have this one for this year open and I encourage everybody to help us out by filling out that survey and telling us about your, you know, what you're doing with machine learning and what you need. Um, but um, that survey targets the communities. Uh, we use the nurse user list and some others. So it's, it's, it's folks that um, they, they may not all be using nurse, but at least they're like potential users of, of nurse resources and definitely doing machine learning for science. And we ask things about you know the kind of problems they're doing, uh, the kind of models they use, um, the the kinds of compute resources they need. Oh, and how happy they are with uh, the things we have in NERSC. Um, so these are some preliminary results from our survey this year. I'm not going to spend too much time because I want to be able to get into the interesting things later on in the talk. Um, but I wanted to kind of show these because it there are some nice and usually in useful insights into what the scientific communities are doing these days. So we asked, you know, the kinds of ways that machine learning fits in their, in our, um, in the community's workflows. And we see most people are, are in this first category, at least in the respondents, right? Which, which could still be a biased sampling of the real communities, but um, most people are, are in this mode where they're doing machine learning for offline data analysis. So they have a data set somewhere on a file system, and now they want to do some analysis on it, and they're going to use machine learning to help with that. Um, but we do see uh, the second biggest one here is, and, and the third actually are related to combining machine learning with simulation, which are cool to see. And we see folks wanting to do machine learning for more real time or online data analysis. And um, a little bit here of uh, folks looking at controlling uh, scientific instruments. A lot of people are still using uh, convolutional neural networks, which is not too surprising. Um, but uh, I think in one of our earlier surveys, traditional ML was kind of a dominant one. So now we see uh, some turning point, I think, where um, also down here on the left, more folks are using PyTorch than um, at least claim to be using scikit-learn. That was definitely flopped before. Uh, or it was scikit-learn, then TensorFlow and PyTorch. So um, you can we can see trends over time, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I don't know what else I need to call out here, but you can you can take a look at these offline. Of course, those slides will be shared. Uh, we ask about the scale of resources that people need. So um, while still it looks like the bulk of respondents have problems that are not very large, they can train models on a single GPU in hours, relatively small data sets, tens of gigabytes, um, maybe single device or single node kind of scale. Uh, but we do see these tails here where we need to try and think about how we support those users that, you know, it takes months or even years apparently to train models. Uh, they have terabytes of data, hundreds of terabytes of data. Um, they might be able to run on hundreds of thousands of GPUs and use various forms of parallelism in training their models. I'll sit, come back to the, the forms of parallelism here a little later. Uh, okay, so I already sort of said this, but yeah, uh, we do see folks with large problems and um, potentially a need for large scale training. Um, not too much to say on this one other than just some takeaways. Um, you know, about half of people say they like to use Jupyter Notebooks to develop their models. So that's something we have to kind of take into account. A lot of people are still using CPUs like on Corey Haswell or up here on the upper right, it looks like more people are using CPUs for inference than, um, than GPUs, which is a bit interesting, but again, could be um, a, bi a little bit biased sampling because it's um, the nurse users and a lot of them know Corey. Um, a little bit more on the kinds of outreach that we do. So that empowerment aspect of our strategy. Uh, we, for, uh, for a couple of years in a row, we did this deep learning for science school. In 2019, it was an in-person event week long, it was really great. Um, a lot of great speakers. We had um, good hands-on sessions and posters. Uh, you can find all the videos and, and content there on the web. In 2020, because of the pandemic, we switched to a webinar series. So every week there'd be um, a speaker, um, fewer hands-on things, but uh, still some, some code examples. And we did record all those talks. You can also see those. 
we had a lot more introductory stuff in 2019. And then, then in 2020, it started to get, um, we, we featured more, uh, not quite advanced, but let's say more advanced uh, scientific relevant uh, topics. Um, I mentioned that we do this deep learning at scale tutorial. We've been doing that quite a while, or at least since 2018 at pretty much every supercomputing at some um, ISC conferences in Europe and, and some others. Um, last year at, at SE, that was the first time we got to use Perlmutter for this, which was pretty fun. Well, we're doing it again this year. So if you're going to SC, feel free to, to check it out. And I linked to the full the full video there. Oh, we also uh, posted videos because we were pre-recording videos back then. <clears throat> Um, other things we've been doing not too long ago, there was this NVIDIA organized AI for science bootcamp and, um, they sort of did it in collaboration with us and we opened it up to users. So that also had a good bit of introductory stuff. Sorry for the slack pings here. Um, and you can, I think, view slides on that webpage. Uh, and then we do things like the new user training events regularly, day-to-day -day events like this, here you are, and probably others that I may have forgotten about. Okay, so now I'll switch gears a little bit and start to get into the content from the tutorial. So this, uh, th we, we usually do like a full day tutorial, so obviously I can't cover a lot, but this is to give you a, a little flavor and cover some some aspects of that that, um, that hopefully you'll find useful or interesting, and maybe you can follow up and ask questions or go check out the full material if you're, if you're interested. Um, but, you know, the real theme there is how do we optimize deep learning workloads on HPC and particularly for them to run at large scale, really try to optimize like time to time to solution, right, for scientists. Because scientists need fast and efficient methods. Uh, they need this to enable rapid development and testing of their ideas. Um, but not just that, they may also really need optimized machine learning workloads to fit within their production workloads um, to fit whatever computational constraints there may be. Maybe there's an experimental uh, instrument like the Large Hadron Collider that needs to be able to very quickly make decisions about what data to write out. Or um, folks are, are maybe trying to replace part of a simulation with a machine learning model. But if it's not fast, then you didn't really save anything. Um, but also as a center, we need to think about how we optimize these workloads for all users so that overall the, the throughput of, of NERSC in terms of science is, is optimized. So um, if, if you can make effective use of modern HPC systems like Perlmutter, this can greatly accelerate these workflows. Um, and, and I think the situation is, is getting a bit easier with software and methods and stuff, but it can still be non-trivial. So there's still kind of a need for, for this sort of tutorial content. Um, falling a bit behind. So I'm gonna to try to go a bit fast here, but hopefully I'll be able to at least uh, get the important point across, point, points across and, and, and folks can ask questions where needed. Um, so yeah, so deep learning is very powerful and it's, it's, um, it's showing a lot of promise in a lot of different application areas. But uh, as I already said, it's computationally intensive, especially if we look at training. So training big, deep neural network models. And, um, and again, as we look at more complex problems, larger data sets, larger models, uh, that compute cross costs, these are actually growing with time. This is an open AI plot. It's, it's actually a bit old now. It doesn't show all the latest developments with language models, but you can just see that there's this exponential growth in the amount of compute needed to train popular machine learning models out there. So what do we do? How do we make effective use of HPC for this? Uh, in the tutorial, we break it up into these sorts of categories. So first we look at optimizing the performance of a training workload on a single device. Um, because there's really no point in scaling uh, if you can just get a lot of, you know, uh, it, it makes sense to first look at, at that before you just try to throw hundreds of GPUs at a problem, right? Um, it can be much more efficient in the end. Uh, and then uh, and then we talk about distributing the training across multiple GPUs and multiple nodes on our systems. And then we talk a little bit about optimizing now the distributed performance at scale. I won't talk really at all about the third one here and really only have a little bit on the first one. Um, so this is, this is some content mostly developed by, uh, the NVIDIA folks that we collaborate with in that tutorial. Um, this slide comes from, from one of our, uh, our tutorial last year, but, um, uh, so in the tutorial, when we look at optimizing this training, uh, example on a single GPU, we use NVIDIA Insight Systems to do this, which is really a pretty powerful tool using a profiler, as it says here, it's an essential step in optimizing any code. And Insight Systems lets you view a nicely organized 
well, debatably, I guess, it, it, I think you have to get used to it, but um, it gives you a nice view of the timeline where you can kind of look at what's going on. And um, our tutorial example is really nice, actually, because uh, the kinds of things that you might see in the real world, you can see in that example, you can see things like gaps that come from data loading. You can see things like uh, GPU not being utilized super well because there are a lot of many small kernels being launched. And then we were able to talk about the ways that you, uh, you improve on that. So it can, yeah, it can basically uh, shed light on what's going on in your data pipeline on the GPU, uh, scheduling of kernels. You can annotate things with these NVTX ranges. All that is covered in the, the tutorial, but here's you know a rough idea of how you, you run and site systems down below. Um, and then the kinds of things that are important for optimization, and these are really just lifted from the tutorial. Again, it's, it's, it's a nice example because all of these apply there and we get good speed ups. Um, data loading is a frequent cause of performance loss for uh, users, even for experts, really. It's, it's like the first thing to check, basically. Um, so, you know, in the tutorial, we talk about ways to, to paralyze your I.O. and then to take it further from there. For example, you can use NVIDIA's DALI library, uh, which has a lot of nice features for deep learning data pipelines. Um, nice features to parallelize and kind of cache data on the fly. I also do a lot of your uh, data augmentations, your, your pipeline stuff, your pre-processing on the GPU. Um, and uh, this little plot on the upper right shows that for our tutorial, just how, how much, how many, the kinds of speedups we get from, uh, from various stages of optimization just in the data pipeline. So parallelizing the I.O., um, caching things in memory, and then going to Dolly. So we get over 2x performance on the end-to-end -end thing just from that. Uh, at least I think that's the end-to-end -end, uh, speed up. Um, mixed precision is is something that that is often a, a very useful and great way to speed up training. Helps you leverage the tensor cores on the modern GPUs. It can reduce memory and stuff like this. And the frameworks provide pretty nice capabilities for this now. They make it pretty easy to do automatic mixed precision where it will use FP16 where it can. And they give you the features to uh, avoid numerical underflow issues that, that can come about um, by, by automatically scaling the gradients uh, just when doing the, the computations that, that, um, that may have a risk of numerical issues. Um, and then there's, there's ways to um, reduce um, like overheads of, of launching kernels that are fairly small. So uh, just in time compilation, uh, NVIDIA Apex library has some fused operators. And then um, there's a more recent NVIDIA CUDA graphs uh, library. Um, so we go through those in the tutorial as well. And basically these, uh, these are um, mostly these are just ways of fusing kernels together and getting better GPU utilization. They can give you good speed ups. And there are other tricks as well that I won't cover here, but you have to uh, check out the tutorial, tutorial to see them all. In the tutorial, when we put everything together, just on a single device, we get uh, something like a six times speed up. So that can give you a sense for really sometimes how, how useful it can be to go through this before trying to distribute across many devices. But let's say you've done that. Now you're ready to do some actual parallel training of models. There are different ways to parallelize the training of neural networks. Data parallelism on the left is the most common. That's where you take your your data, your data, basically your data samples, and partition those or distribute those across GPUs or nodes. You you replicate your model so everybody has the same copy of the model, um, and you do some synchronizations at the right at the right point in time. It's the most common. It's the easiest way to speed up training. Um, but um, nowadays, more and more, we see folks turning to model parallelism. Sometimes it's because you need to. In fact, I think that's the most common case, really. If you have a model that's just too big that you can't fit in memory on a single device, you essentially have to uh, distribute that model across devices. You can do stuff like in the middle here where every layer of a neural network itself might be partitioned across devices um, or something on the right, which is called pipeline parallelism, where different layers of a network are on different devices and the data is kind of streaming through your, your system that way. Um, uh, I should really hurry up now. So uh, I think I'll mostly skip this, but this talks a little bit about the most common way of, of doing this, which is synchronous data parallel scaling, um, where let's say you're trying to uh, use more and more GPUs, parallelize further, larger scale. Uh, there are different ways to think of it. Um, you can kind of hold your batch size fixed, uh, or you can kind of try to grow your batch size, have a larger batch size as you're bringing in more and more processors. Um, essentially growing the global batch size. But there are different trade-offs here. As you increase the batch size, it can be harder to train models. 
Um, but if you keep the batch size fixed, uh, you run out of compute per per GPU as you further subdivide that, and you can run into network bottlenecks. So that's essentially what's covered there. Um, but um, uh, more generally, if we're looking at how, how do you actually how does this actually speed up training? Um, you know, if if you look at stochastic gradient descent, essentially, you know, you're you're sampling batches of data from your overall data set. You're computing a gradient, and then um, you have a step size that, that says how how much you try to optimize the the parameters of the model to get a little bit better, right? Um, and so uh, we can converge faster. We're trying to get to the answer faster. You know, we're taking a sequence of steps. You can do that by taking fewer, uh, bigger, and and or faster steps, right? Um, so what we're doing in practice, usually with data parallel training, is we're trying to push up to larger batch sizes which actually let us use larger learning rates. So we're taking larger steps and larger batch sizes also paralyze better across more processors. Uh, so this is the kind of way you do it, but you you have limitations. You can't scale to arbitrary uh, number of GPUs. It's a bit problem dependent, but it's, it's, it's definitely not a free lunch. Um, and um, this slide just sort of says that there are some rules of thumb for how you can, let's say, increase learning rates as you increase batch sizes. Sometimes you can kind of scale it linearly with the batch size or um, using a square root rule, uh, which is kind of more motivated by how the, the gradient noise scales. Um, but really the situation can be more complex and for a given problem, you know, a situation might look more like this on the lower right where uh, the optimal learning rate just depends on the batch size according to some relationship like that. I'll skip the other parts here. Um, and I think these slides too, that just this, kind of dive in a little bit further into what what are the sources of challenges as you go to large batch sizes. Uh, essentially, folks have just found that at large batch sizes, you, you tend to be more likely to overfit. You tend to end up in sharper minima in the uh, object in your in your loss uh, objective landscape here. And sharp minima are very um, sensitive to differences between training and test data sets. Hey, excuse me. Can you go somewhere else? Uh, I'll skip this one here. Um, there are other tricks to try. I think one thing to call out here is that there are more modern optimizers for training deep neural networks, um, things like LAM. You, you see that this LAM optimizer is, is particularly popular for the most recent uh, state-of-the-art really large language models, which are the largest models in the world these days. Um, if we're talking about scale and pushing on scale, uh, MLPerf and ML Commons, this is one area where a lot of innovation happens. So ML Commons is an organization that publishes these MLPerf benchmarks. They're the um, basically the standard performance benchmarks for machine learning and industry these days. Um, if you look at the latest results now, it's gotten to the point where you can train ResNet 50 in like 12 seconds, and they're pushing up to 4,000 accelerators. Um, we got involved in ML Commons to help develop an HPC benchmark suite. So here we drew from scientific applications. Um, I list them here, but I'm not, I'm not going to talk about them in depth, but these are interesting things you may, uh, applications you may have heard about before. Um, we've been doing some releases. Uh, so ML per benchmarks are organized with these submission rounds where participants come from all around the world on their own, with their own HPC systems. Uh, they measure results on their systems and, and things get published during supercomputing. Um, I think I'll skip the rest. Maybe one... Yeah, one other thing to say here is that this has been a really valuable experience for us at NERSC. Uh, at the last submission round, which was published at Supercomputing in 2021, we got to use Perlmutter. We had really nice competitive results uh, leading in some categories or like uh, close to leading in, in some others. And it was um, a really great opportunity for us to understand the performance of our systems, uh, particularly at scale and, and shake out issues and find uh, problems that need to be fixed. Uh, then I just have a few examples of other kind of state-of-the-art large-scale things, which I'll go through really quickly. So uh, Megatron Turing is, is it's essentially a code base with NVIDIA and Microsoft, um, uh, a code base that supports really, really large language model training and, and various forms of parallelism. There was a bit of press around this 530 billion parameter model, which at least at the time was the largest. I don't know if it still is, but it was state-of-the-art in, in some um, natural language processing tax, tasks. And, and uh, this is an example of where, where they combine all forms of parallelism. So uh, eight-way tensor parallelism, that's like each layer of a model is partitioned across eight GPUs on a node. Then there's that pipeline parallelism across nodes. So different layers of a model are now across 35 different nodes. And then on top of that, they also have data parallelism replicated up to thousands of GPUs. So uh, pretty impressive stuff. And you can read more at those blogs. <clears throat> 
uh, then some science results from some of our colleagues. Um, you may have heard about these before, but this one is um, basically doing self-supervised learning for sky surveys to detect these uh, gravitational lensing events. Uh, Peter Harrington is, is one of the authors and, um, and some others at the lab. And um, yeah, I think like an important takeaway here was that they could they could do pre-training techniques that are self-supervised and then fine tune on things that they want and, um, and get better results out. ForecastNet is uh, a work between some folks here as well as uh, NVIDIA and maybe some others too. Um, but uh, JD was our former postdoc writing a lot on this and then current postdoc Shashank and Peter Harrington work a lot on this as well. So this is uh, basically doing weather forecasting using some fancy state-of-the-art uh, Fourier operator type methods and um, basically giving really uh, state-of-the-art results in terms of um, in terms of machine learning methods uh, on par with numerical methods, but much, much faster. Uh, so then I think I'll just conclude since I'm actually a little bit over time, um, just say that, um, you know, AI for science, it requires supercomputer scale capabilities. We're trying to deliver this. Um, it's great to see all the, um, the growth and sophistication and maturity in science. We're excited to see what comes next and uh, feel free to reach out if you're looking for jobs or want to collaborate. That's all, thanks.